It's time for the movie raid, and tonight's victim again will be Thomas G. Waits, actor, director, played in months many films as well as TV, such as John Carpenter's The Thing and The Warriors. Hello. Hey, Mike. How are you? I'm peachy. Good. So, yeah, I was saying uh, when we were talking before, I did an interview yesterday because I have a film that's coming out on uh, DVD that I shot back in 1977, if you can remember back that far. It's a movie called On the Yard, and, um, you know, it was so long ago that they didn't have VHS even back then. Wow. But it, it's finally being uh, picked up and turned into a DVD, and it was my very first feature film. And it's called On the Yard. It's a prison drama starring uh, myself, of course, and John Hurd, an actor named Mike Kellen, uh, Richie Bright, who's no longer with us, Joe Grafasi, Dominic Canese has a part in it. Uh, there's a lot of great actors in it, and um, it got tremendous reviews when it first opened back in 78, uh, Lines Around the Block reviews. The New York Times loved it. and. So it's just been sitting around, and uh, I don't know, it's one of those independent... It was an independent before there was such thing as independent, directed by a man named Raphael Silver. Yeah, you probably know his wife, Joan Micklin Silver, who directed uh, Hester Street and Head Over Heels, and uh, another movie with Kevin Bacon that I can't remember the name of, Him and Her, or His Story, Her Story, something like that. Anyway, uh, so that's going to be coming out on DVD pretty soon, so you could probably get it on Netflix. On the Yard, based on a novel by a man named Malcolm Brawley, who also is unfortunately no, no longer with us. But he was a guy, you know, like in his early 40s, and he'd spent 26 years in prison by the time I met him. Wow. Yeah. So he did his time, I think mostly bank robbery or whatever. But anyway, it's a prison drama about the hierarchical system in prisons. And uh, it's quite an interesting movie. I, I, I haven't seen it in a while, but the last time I saw it, I... I was 22 when I did it, my first uh, feature film. Nice. But yeah, check check that out. Um, the other things that I have going on is, I don't know if you know this, but I'm also a musician. You know, I'm just a three-chord guitar, rhythm guitar guy, but I'm a songwriter. And I have a, a little music act that I'm putting together called The Old Man and the Kid. Me on guitar and a little bit of piano and my my partner is a 16-year-old boy in high school that plays the cajones and sings very, very well. He's a great singer. And so we've been developing that, and we're going to start playing out in New York pretty soon here, it looks like. Nice. But that's that's very interesting, yeah. Uh, we do ori mostly original songs. We do a few covers. I'm a big The Band fan, uh, so I do a few The Band songs. You may be too young to remember them, but that's back in the 70s and early 80s, the band. Uh, actually, they split up in 76, I think. Hmm. Um, and then the other thing that I'm doing is uh, I wrote a play called McCare, M-A-C-A-I-R-E, and it's a musical, but it's actually a play with music. And once a year, I go to Germany to a place called Cologne, or Cologne, as the Germans call it. They bring me over there, and I go to a film school, and I direct them in a play. So uh, I kind of talk them into doing my play. So it'll be the world premiere of McCare by Thomas G. Waits, uh, words and music written by Thomas G. Waits, book by Thomas G. Waits, and I won't be in it. <laughs> I'll be direct. I'm not with Thomas G. Waits. How are you doing, Mike? Uh, I am doing just fine. Just fine. I do, can't tell you the movie rage soon just fine. If you guys would actually listen, <laughs> you would know how great it would be. But I ain't gonna tell you. Have you ever actually incorporated your music all in all your plays, or have you been starting doing that now? Mm, I, I try to incorporate my music in all my plays. I directed uh, Shakespeare's As You Like It this summer at the Brew College of Performing Arts, and um, I had written uh, a score for it, basically, with another guy. And uh, almost turned it into a musical. I mean, not quite, but there was certainly a lot of music in it, a lot of excellent singing. And it was all my acting students, because as you know, I run the TGW, Thomas G. Waits, acting studio here in New York City. And one of the things that I do differently is that I try to create opportunities for my students, not just to be in my acting class, but also to be in plays so that they get the, uh, the opportunity to perform in New York City, which is... You know, the only way you really get good. Yeah, it can it can be really difficult, especially now 
concerned what's co- what's been going on. But do you uh, have kind of a non-profit thing going on, or do you make it pretty fair for everybody? Yeah, no, it's it's not a non-profit. That's a very hard status to, to come by. Non-profit. Yeah. Uh, the five hundred one three C. It's they, they don't give them, give them out very often. Um, they used to give them out, you know, like they were water. But ever since nine eleven, they kind of cut way back on those things. So no, I'm just a straight ahead uh, little, you know, doing business as Thomas G. Waits, and um, you know, uh, we. Fortunately, however, we are going to get the support of the school of Guru College this summer, and they're going to co-produce it with me, so it's not all going to be on my neck, so to speak. And I'll be doing Taming of the Shrew and possibly Much Ado About Nothing to Shakespeare comedies. One of my goals in life is to direct all of Shakespeare. I think that's how you get, you know, Mozart makes you smart by listening to it. Doing Shakespeare makes you great. And by listening to Devo, it makes you drunk. (laughs) <laughs> uh, <laughs> or me another one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, do it. <laughs> yeah. What would you? You, uh, you want to come to a, a directing point of view? Uh, what What would you expect out of your shows, or at least in, in general? What would you from a from a director's point of view? You know, first of all, they have to be entertaining. You know, if they're not entertaining, there there's no point. You know, nobody wants to come in and uh, you know have to suffer through a piece of life. They want to, you know, be, there's a French word called divertissement, which means divert, you know, to divert someone's attention, to, to, to change their consciousness, their state of mind. So the first thing is the project, the film or the movie uh, or the, the TV show or the, the play, whatever you're doing, it has to be entertaining on a certain level. You have to be able to grab, that is, arrest the audience's attention. And then after that, depending on what the tone of the pieces, you know, whether you're working on a comedy or a tragedy or comic tragedy, historical, comical, tragical, historical, comical, you have to capture the right tone so that, you know, you bring the audience into the story, take them on a journey. I guess one of the things I try to do aside from making it entertaining is you know, to make it um, truthful. It's got to be truthful, otherwise people don't watch. It doesn't mean it has to be real. It can be unrealistic. Any way that you put it, as long as you're putting it out there, you're telling a story, you have to bring them into the story somehow. Yep, absolutely. you got to make some kind of a point. It, it could be political, it could be whatever, but mm-hmm. there's, there's got to be a point somewhere across in the story. It's not just, it can't be a bunch of stuff, oh, uh, what the hell is this? <laughs> right. It's got to have a point of view. Well, that's really a directing, that's really a directing issue, is you have to have a point of view. That is... What that means, translated, is you have to have an idea about the story, a particular idea about the story, whatever that might be, and you want to convey that story. Uh, some people call it a concept. You know, you have to have a concept for the story, so that if you're doing, a, you know, Hamlet, which is the story of of a of a boy who who loses his dad, a man who loses his dad untimely, father is murdered by his uncle, and it's been arranged apparently by his mother and his uncle. And it's a, it's a revenge tragedy. You have to decide, you know, what your point of view about that play is. And most people um, perceive it and retell it as the story of, of a kid who, you know, really kind of has a, an Oedipal complex with his mom. He really kind of, you know, love hates his mother. And so they perceive this story and translate the story from that perspective. I perceive the story as a kind of a love-hate relationship with his dad, that it's a story about a, a man in search of his father, despite the fact that his father's passed. So it's all what your idea is, you know. I know that's a bit cerebral for radio, but it's also uh, true, and, and I think interesting and valuable. Yeah, regardless of what it is, you can learn from it as well, even if it is on film. That's right, that's right. Not, not only are you entertained, but hopefully you're moved, and, and hopefully, you know, you learn something from it. So, for example, my play, McCare, is, is a play about a, about a 19th century gangster in France in the 1820s. And uh, it's a comedy. You know, it's based on a story by um, Robert Louis Stevenson. And I was hired, uh, commissioned to, to adapt it to the stage quite a few years ago. And, you know, I've just stuck with it ever since. And now I finally get my chance to, to put it up. How do you feel about it now, I mean, as far as, far as the production? It's good. You know, I did it at the Actors Studio a few years ago as a stage reading it. Fantastic. I mean, it, you know, not to toot my own horn, but the music came off 
very, very well. I had a lot of great singers and great musicians playing for me, and uh, it was just beautiful. And the story, you know, it's very stylized, uh, very high style. And uh, Robert McCare was, in fact, an historical figure. You know, he was a, a gangster that broke out of every prison in, in France. And uh, they couldn't keep this guy tied down. Like, no matter where they put him, he broke out. There are documentaries about him and so forth. My story is imaginary, and it's that he escapes from prison with his partner Bertrand, this big, you know, sort of, uh, you know, Lenny character from Of Mice and Men. And they find themselves at this inn on the day a wedding is supposed to take place. And uh, it's a very exciting story, very funny, uh, but very, you know, emotionally dramatic and entertaining. And, and it all, of course, take, it's, it's a rock and roll musical, but it's a style piece. So it's a period piece with rock and roll music. So, so it really pushes the envelope. Yeah, and it's not really a hesitation, not even for anybody, because look at the Rocky Horror Picture Show. I mean, that's pretty out there, yet it still made a huge, huge hit. It is a cult classic right now. Yeah, it, it, it absolutely was, I, I, it is. I mean, who would have thought the first time they put up the Rocky Horror Picture Show that that was going to end up becoming, uh, you know, the classic that it is, or even the Warriors. You know, they didn't know it was going to be a success. They had no idea that the studio was breaking out while we were shooting that movie. They were so over budget, so far behind schedule. It was like... The suits would show up every other week and be like, come on, let's get this thing moving. Now, of course, you know, they've made, well, the video game has made billions. Yeah, it has. The actors don't make anything. But the <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah like, yeah, I made huge money, but we didn't get shit. <clears throat> In fact, I, I saw David Patrick Kelly yesterday. Oh, uh, wow, how's he doing? Uh, yeah, he seemed okay. I didn't really get a chance to speak to him. Uh, I was walking down Lexington Avenue, and he was... I think having lunch with his wife, and uh, you know, he gave me a very supportive and friendly nod below, and I'm a great admirer of his. He's also a very musical fellow. You know, he's in. I think he's in once on Broadway. Hmm. You know, he's of course famous for going uh, Warriors. Come out and play. He's the one that invented that. Yes, that was kind of like a uh, last minute thing because he was the one that suggested to get the bottles that oh. from from wherever and say, hey, what if I did this? And he also stated that. It was from a childhood experience because of, of a kid saying his name outside of his house, uh, if I got that right. And yeah. that's what he incorporated. He put that in there, and it that's fit, right. fit very, very well. And uh, I'm glad they kept that there. Yeah, he's a very good actor and a uh, very successful actor and a uh, nice fellow. Uh, well, Remar, yeah, he's been doing a lot of good stuff, too. Yeah, yeah. He was in the um, uh, Quentin Tarantino movie this past summer. I forget what it's called. But uh, Django? interesting it's good it, you know uh yeah james does a lot of good stuff what would you consider a sacrifice in acting as far as, far as that goes a sacrifice yeah what, what would you consider a sacrifice you know like how the military well they would have to leave their families to go do whatever they got to do I, I would say probably you know we give up that you know notion having a security you know there is no security in my line of work. You know, you kind of sing for your supper. And uh, a lot of guys, you know, take jobs with a pharmaceutical company or what have you, and you stay there for 35 years or 30 years and you retire. And, you know, you, you have a secure life in front of you. And I've never had that. So I sacrificed um, security for freedom. And I don't have any regrets about it. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it for the world. You know, I mean, I wish I'd done a few things differently in terms of my own, you know, activities. <laughs> but uh, I wouldn't change anything. It's been a great life for me. Yeah, what we just discussed earlier before we got here is books are no longer it really. They're only on tablets now that you can just read on the internet, or they just go straight to movies. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's just best that way, or do you have more? Do you think? the literature should be more out there as itself. Well, you know, I think that without literature, we're doomed as a society, you know. We need literature. Uh, literature is how we gain perspective on life, and it's a, you know, many times a moral guidepost. Uh, literature is a escape from reality. It's, it's a perspective on reality. It's, it's a rejuvenation of the spirit, actually. It gives you a chance to, you know, re- define who you are by virtue of the fact that you identify with a character and story. 
you know, I think we are losing that to some extent because, you know, everything is at our fingertips. No, you just press a button. Why read the story when you can go get the cliff notes? It'll take you two minutes. Yeah, but we got all these luxury electronics and everything. It's like to the point mm-hmm. to the point where you can't really enjoy a book anymore. It's like, what's the point? I can just look it out over here. Mm-hmm. Or just, oh, I'm going to watch the movie instead. Well, you can't really get all all the information from the book into a movie. You, just like, like a lot of would say, you can't squeeze the book into a movie. Right. You only take I, no, so I mean, much. You, you know, we... That's why you need acting training, because you need people like me and the people that I train to learn to master the power of language and the words so that they have learned how to tell stories to keep people's attention. And, um, you know, it's that power of the story that we can never, ever lose. You know, we can never, ever live without that power of the story. And I get, you know, concerned that we're losing touch with literature and the process of exploring literature and you know the process of understanding literature and that's why you need people that understand like for example Shakespeare and you know that's why I'm you know I figured if I was going to be an acting teacher I was going to do something different than other people and I was going to teach Shakespeare you know um, and even as far back as like the warriors I mean one of the reasons I got cast was because it was a verbal character you know and uh, he wasn't the guy smashing up the fence or you know you know taking out his bowie knife he was the guy that was like reasoning and evaluating and logically figuring out what to do next um i think that that is you know because i was trained as an actor at juilliard and i've carried that sense of the classics with me you know it just seems like everything's more superficial rather than uh, more real. yeah it does seem so and we have to fight to hold on to that you know even with music even with just absolutely it, with music Absolutely with music. I love listening to the old classics, man. Mm, like who, for example? Uh, anything. Any, anything that you hear like now. You know, Sweet Home Alabama, for example, the song. There you go. That's <laughs> a great song. Love it. Why not? You know, everybody knows it. Everybody knows it. The same thing with film. And it's like, it, I compare between music and film because they're a lot alike. They share a lot of things in common. Yeah, I think they do. I think they absolutely do. The, both are equally making a lot of have made impact over 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 the decades even way back even from the egyptian days even way even before then no question no it, question because that's a, that's the kind of impact it's, it's been on now because when, if you look if you fast forward to now you got kids out there it's like what well, has no idea what what's what like a lot of them's never even heard of the title don the dead or anything <laughs> <laughs> or anything like that it's uh, with all the things that's happening now, as far as not to get political or anything, with with all the government and all this and this, do you think it's actually going to affect film? Um, well, I think that Steven Spielberg kind of nailed it when he said, you know, things are really moving more toward television. You know, a guy like Spielberg almost couldn't get Lincoln made because uh, it was almost an HBO movie. You know, it wasn't until the last minute, uh, I think, that he was able to get the funding for a feature film. Feature films are becoming an anomaly. You know, it's becoming so difficult for people to raise the money. Um, There's a wonderful documentary that Alec Baldwin did called Seduced and Abandoned, and it's a story of he and uh, James Toback, the writer, going to Cannes Film Festival and interviewing, you know, everybody. I mean, uh, Francis Coppola and Martin Scorsese and, uh, you know, every famous director, Bernardo Petrolucci, and a lot of famous actors as well, interviewing them and asking them, you know, how the, how they keep going. And it's becoming more difficult. I don't know, politically, if that has anything to do with it. I think less than politically has to do with the economy, which perhaps is political, but getting the money to do a movie has become a very challenging proposition. You know, even 10 years ago, it was much easier. Yeah, it, it's becoming so hard that the fact that you could either, like, like you just said, it could it could be either political, it could be more financial, it could be more of the marketing side, it could be the whole the whole thing. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. it's everywhere. But that's the thing it, with what's happening now, as far as the economy wise now, it's like you think of the possibility it could actually hurt the industry. Uh, I don't think so. No, I I think people are always going to need entertainment. They're always going to need escape, and there's always going to be a need. You know, there's always going to be a need for a a good film, you know. Um, I think that uh, a lot of people are turning to TV for more 
you know, uh, innovative and exploratory possibilities. But uh, no, there's always going to be the need for a good film. Um, I, I, I do think it's becoming obscenely expensive to make a picture. You know, it's, yeah. it's really getting out of control. I mean, $10 million is considered a low-budget movie. It's just insane. Yeah. In a third world country with $10 million. When you go in for a movie theater and you watch a film, what what are your reactions? Like, you're the viewer, I should say. When, when you, what do you want expect to see here? Well, you know, just like we talked about before, I mean, I want to, I want to be entertained. I want to, I want to be, you know, drawn into the story. I want to be, most importantly, I want to be able to identify. I want to be able to see me in the story, you know, even if it's a woman. Even if the main character is a woman, I want to be able to go, you know, that's me going through that crisis. And that main character has to be under some kind of, you know, threat or on some kind of journey or somehow has to have the, the poetry of suffering and uh, has to draw me in. I'll go ahead and plug in your plays one more time. Uh, so where where sure. can we check this out? 